<laughs> hey Sharon, hey, how are you today? I'm well, thank you. That's great. Today we're going to talk about the business partner from hell. This is one of the this is one of the very old concepts, but it just rings as true today as mm -hmm. it did 20 years ago. Well, Mark, I have a joint business. What factor or question should I be considering? Right. Uh, Sharon, how, how would you like to be in business with your partner's husband's next partner, solicitor, accountant, or other well-meaning friend? Why is this an important question? Well, most people, uh, when they're in a partnership, are happy with the person that they're in business with. Uh, but the truth is, uh, if they then had to turn around and be in business with their business partner's spouse, it just creates a whole different scenario. And, um, and therefore, uh, you know, you want to make sure that people who are in business together don't have to end up being in partnership with the spouse of the deceased business partner. Makes a lot of sense. So to cover all bases, as it were, what are the key points we should address on this issue? Sure. Uh, partnerships work best when uh, spouses are kept away from the business. <clears throat> and, um, this is not sexist in any means. They can be men, they can be women. But really, businesses work best, and, and I've seen so many businesses where the rule is that uh, the wives or the husbands, the spouses, aren't allowed to come into the business and give advice. And that way, the people that set the business up in the first place still get on really well because that's why they set up the business together and they're not getting advice from, from outside people that don't have much to do with the business. So, number one is uh, they work best when spouses are kept away from the business. Uh, point two is it's not realistic to expect that the remaining partner uh, has a new person just forced upon them. So, for example, if you and I are in partnership in a business and, and you know, we both had great skills that were complementary for the business and let's say your spouse knew nothing about mm -hmm what your skills are on the business and, and how our business really runs because they're busy with their own, well, me suddenly being in partnership with him uh, would, would just be fraught with danger. So it, it's not fair or realistic to expect that um, uh, whoever's left behind just is forced to have a new partner. It could be your lawyer, for example, and all of a sudden I'm, um, you know, I'm in a sales business and a lawyer's coming and telling me how to run my sales business. So that's not a realistic thing. Point three is uh, it's best to document a buy-sell agreement now and make sure both partners are, are acutely aware um, of what the rules are in regard to that buy-sell agreement. Uh, point four is make sure that money is part of that agreement. That's also a tricky part of the, uh, of the agreement and you want to make sure that that's funded and mostly that's done with, with life insurance. And point five, um, it's really the summary, and that is just document and fund your agreement with your business partner and uh, review it annually. And, and the truth is, in regard to most of these arrangements, the agreements are that if one partner dies, uh, there's uh, an insurance policy in place to make sure that that partner's family gets the money and the remaining partner gets the shares. And he is then, or she, is then able to bring in another partner at their discretion and not have a new partner forced on them. So after considering all these points that you raise, what should I, should I do to pre prevent these problems actually arising? Well, as I said, Sharon, the, you know, the simplest thing is just to go see your lawyer or through us, get a buy-sell agreement um, uh, created and uh, just make sure that that buy-sell agreement has really strict rules in regard to what happens on the death of one of the other of the partners. And, uh, and the truth is when, when you're doing these things, it's an easy conversation because usually both, both partners are sitting there thinking, well, if my partner dies, I don't want to be in business with their spouse. So, so you know, you, you, you're having an easy conversation because both of them are thinking exactly the same thing. That's no disrespect to spouses. Um, but, uh, you know, you just document it, you get it funded and, uh, and you review it each year. So how would you summarise the differences experienced when a plan B is put in place? Sure. Look, what's, uh, what's tended to happen uh, in the experience that I've had in these areas is where people don't have a buy-sell agreement, uh, normally the estate or the lawyer or the spouse comes along and harasses whoever the remaining business partner is. They're always wanting money. They can't contribute. Uh, they're they're, uh, they're, they're non-contributory, but they're very wanting of, of money out of the business. And the other thing is 
banks get very nervous when one partner goes and there's no uh, uh, there's no you know buy sell agreement in place. So by not having an agreement, I mean there's just a list of disasters that tends to happen. Uh, by having an agreement, uh, the family of the deceased get a big check. The uh, remaining partner gets the business, and everyone's free then to go on and make their choices in regard to what they want to have have happen in the future. In other words, they're in control. Uh, they're, they're not at the mercy of someone who knows really little about the, the business. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Sharon.